Earlier this winter, Dennis Oland made the walk to the courthouse in St. John, New Brunswick to be tried for the second time in the murder of his father. It had taken him the better part of eight years to get here. There is a new twist at the retrial of Dennis Oland. The twists and turns of that retrial took 16 weeks in court, November to March. A verdict is expected in June. For Dennis Oland, what a long, strange trip it must have seemed. And it started here in St. John in July 2011. It was at number 52 Canterbury Street, the office of the Far End Corporation, the investment firm belonging to Dennis's father, multimillionaire Richard Oland. On July 7th, as usual, Oland's assistant arrived about 9 a.m. But when she took the stairs to his second floor office, nothing would ever be as usual again. In the heart of sedate St. John, it was obvious something bad had happened to the man most here know as Dick. Preliminary results of the autopsy, coupled with the evidence at the scene, clearly indicated that Richard Olin was a victim of foul play, homicide. The 69-year-old Oland had been bludgeoned with a hammer-like object, inflicting more than 40 wounds in his neck, hands, and head, including 14 skull fractures. His body lay next to the desk, surrounded by blood and brain tissue. I was frankly stunned, as I'm sure that was everyone's first reaction. Neighbor Kelly Patterson says for family and friends, there was disbelief. Did this make sense? Was it plausible that someone would want to murder him? I couldn't imagine why. I, I can't imagine uh, why he would be an obvious person. <laughs> if someone in St. John's going to be murdered, he would be the last person I would think of. But imagine it or not, Dick Oland was dead. And there were only two questions. Who did it and why? The Olands have been called Atlantic royalty with a family fortune built on the iconic Moosehead beer brand. Author and journalist Stephen Kimber. They permeate every aspect of society, political, business, uh, philanthropic. I mean, whatever you want to say, they are, are part of that society and have been for generations. And Dick Olin personified that. The president of the Canada Games, Richard Olin. The kind of guy who hobnobbed with prime ministers and real royalty. But what Dick Oland was not was an easy man, described by one of his daughters as someone who could make an enemy of anyone. A business associate said to know him is to dislike him. And he seemed especially hard on his son, Dennis, who followed his father's footsteps away from the brewery into the investment business. His relationships with his children changed after he left Moosehead. He was much more difficult to, to deal with, and it seemed to particularly affect the son, Dennis. And so did Dick's affair with local real estate agent Diana Sedlicek. It had gone on for years, though he'd apparently never told the truth to Connie, his wife of five decades. But so much more about the Olin's affairs would soon be on public display. When his body was found, family members were called to the St. John Police Headquarters. Okay. You can just have a seat right there. Right? Dick's only son, Dennis, arrives about 6 p.m. to speak to investigator Stephen Davidson. It's been a long day, huh? Oh, yeah. He's been told his father died suddenly, but given few details. Dennis seems relaxed, even talkative. Yeah, well, the biggest thing that's on my mind is... is what happened. Mm -hmm. um, Dennis doesn't specifically ask police how Dick died, but he does offer a theory about a possible killer, his father's mistress. The only person that comes to mind is this supposed girlfriend because she really seems to be a whack job. Mm -hmm. Like they call her the dragon lady. Mm -hmm. You know, she's she's this hostile uh, somebody who you'd think could be that fatal attraction type person. Yes. Increasingly, the questions focus on tensions between father and son. Dennis describes the bad blood between them, even at Christmas dinner. 
times. Everything is regimented. Yes. Okay, everything has to be perfect. Everything gets put down okay. and you're a waiter the whole time. Mm -hmm. And you're on your toes. And if something messes up, then, you know, you just... And so it's it, those intense situations, which were, were, were everything has to be perfect when mm -hmm. you can sort of, or, you know, wouldn't, uh, you know, it wouldn't go over well. That's also how Dennis described their relationship when he became Dick's financial advisor. He said his father, the client, treated him like an order taker. I guess. At one point, Constable Keith Copeland enters the room, apparently hoping some good cop, bad cop will shake up the interrogation. I've been watching this interview since it started. I've been and right away, Copeland is pointing his finger at Dennis. You didn't plan this, Dennis. He brought this on. Pushed you, pushed you, pushed you, squeezed you, rubbed your face in the fact that he controls it all. Disrespected you, disrespected your mother. The officer insists financial pressure and his father's affair pushed Dennis over the edge. And the truth is, your father was a mean son of a bitch. He controlled every penny that walked through that house. He disrespected your mother, didn't give her money, argued with her about where, how much she spent on groceries, made you pay your own way to go away with him. Did Dennis finally get sick and tired of being browbeaten and abused? But Oland has spoken to his lawyer and he stays silent. Will you take advantage of that opportunity? Will you tell me what happened? So yes or no? No. We're done. The police seem convinced they've got their man, but with no confession, there's not enough to hold him. Dennis Oland walks out free for now. And for over two years after his father was murdered, Oland would live in a kind of no man's land, widely known as the prime suspect, but not yet charged. Then, in November 2013, this. Members from the St. John Police Force arrested Dennis Olin, the son of Richard Olin, and charged him with second degree murder. But even when officially accused of killing his father, for two more years, he'd be out on bail awaiting trial still a familiar figure on the streets of St. John. After the break, Dennis Olin's first murder trial and an unexpected verdict. And he just started sobbing, uh, wailing really uncontrollably. And it almost sounded like a, a wild, wounded animal. They called it the O.J. Simpson case of the Maritimes, the murder everyone had an opinion about. The cast of characters at court became local household names. The accused, Dennis Oland, and his wife, Lisa. Connie Oland, the defendant's mother and wife of the victim. The prosecution. The defense. Reporters like the CBC's Bobby Jean McKinnon. Today we learn just how Richard Olin died. He suffered 46 blows to his body, six of them defensive wounds to his hands, the other 40 sharp and blunt injuries to his head and neck. The prosecution laid out the main points of the case against Dennis Olin. First were the personal debts they called his motive for killing his father. In all, he owed three quarters of a million dollars, mostly to Dick. He was on the edge and, you know, people can do things you wouldn't expect them to do when they're, when they have no other options, nowhere else to turn. Secondly, there was the strange pattern of visits on July 6th that Dennis Olin made to his father's office. There was plenty of parking, so why did security cameras capture Dennis's silver car passing 52 Canterbury Street three times in seven minutes? Prosecutors claimed he was working up the courage to confront Dick. Dennis told police that he went to the office twice that afternoon. Here, security video shows him leaving at 6.12 p.m. after the second visit. But Oland never said he returned shortly after that for a third time 
when he was alone with his father, the last person known to see Dick Oland alive. Prosecutors maintain that is when the murder took place. Then there was Dick Oland's missing cell phone. When his body was discovered, his wallet, Rolex watch, and the keys to his BMW were all still on the desk. But Dick's cell phone was gone. Among the last activity on it was a text from his mistress, Diana Sedlicek, the day he died, and this voicemail from her the day before. Hi, my love. It's 25-7. I'm on my way back to the house now. Catch you? And say hello, at least. Yes, For eight years since, there's been no sign of that cell phone. Prosecutors suggested Dennis Oland might have it. Finally, there's the issue of what Oland was wearing the day his father was killed. These pants, the shoes, a dress shirt, and a navy blazer. He told the police he wore a navy blue blazer. He was very specific about it. A dress shirt, not this, a you know, collar dress shirt. Yeah. And a navy blazer. And a navy blazer. Yeah. OK. But security video from July 6th shows Dennis not in a blue blazer, but a brown sport jacket. Here at Tim Hortons. Then leaving his father's office, he later claimed in the confusion of his dad's death, he misremembered the color of the coat. But consider this, the morning after his interrogation, when Dennis Olin knew he was the suspect. Where was the brown sport jacket? It had already been dropped off at the local dry cleaner. It wouldn't be forensically tested for over four months, but even then, police still identified spots of blood and Dick Olin's DNA. The prosecution presented those areas of evidence as proof of Olin's guilt. But to his supporters, it was all circumstantial. They thought it was just a matter of time until Dennis Oland was free again. As family friends Kelly Patterson and Larry Kane told us three years later, the only public comments they've made. I didn't hear one thing through all of that that would shake my belief in, in his innocence. There was nothing. And in fact, what happened was day after day of the testimony, you realized, like, this is really ridiculous. Of course he's going to get off. That's exactly... Um how we all felt, uh, you know, he, uh, we, we expected to be at someone's home celebrating that night. But that wasn't to be. The trial lasted three months, one of the longest ever in New Brunswick. Just before Christmas 2015, the jury announced its verdict, and it was a shocker. Dennis Oland, guilty of second degree murder. It was almost like all of the air got sucked right out of the room, and, and he just started sobbing, uh, wailing really uncontrollably, and it almost sounded like a, a wild, wounded animal or something. Oland would be sentenced to life in prison with no parole for at least 10 years. But if the verdict was a stunner, so was what happened next. Dennis Oland's lawyers asked for an appeal, claiming judicial error. Oland would spend about 10 months behind bars, but eventually his guilty verdict was overturned. He would be ordered to stand trial once again for the murder of his father. In November, seven and a half years after Dick Oland was killed, four and a half after Dick's son was convicted of doing it, Dennis Oland returned to the courthouse in St. John. The first time he'd been found guilty by a jury, this time, Justice Terence Morrison would preside over the trial alone. Christopher Hicks is a criminal lawyer in Toronto. What's the conventional wisdom going into a retrial in a judge alone situation? Well, all retrials are difficult. They're difficult for all of the players because you've been over this territory before. This is all plowed ground. And for the defense, speaking for myself, it's, it's more difficult to get your game face on again, mm -hmm. to do it, to think of something new, or something you might do again, or something new that you can do for the first time. According to Hicks, what Dennis Olin's testimony did in the retrial was to raise reasonable doubt about the DNA on his brown sport jacket. An expert said the chance it wasn't his dad's was one in 20 quintillion. 
But Oland explained that the jacket had been stored right next to his father's clothing, and Dick's DNA could easily have been transferred to it then. It hung in a closet, the same closet as his father's clothes had been hung, because they were doing renovations and they had their clothing together at some point. And there was another overriding issue in the second trial, the competence of the St. John police investigation, or the lack of it. For example, police themselves used Dick Olin's office bathroom for two days before they tested it for evidence of blood or DNA from the killer. The defense claimed officers themselves frequently used this rear door, which could have been the killer's escape route, but somehow never tested it for fingerprints or other forensic evidence. And so many police visited the crime scene that potential clues like this bloody footprint lost their investigative value. That was the point of the defense. It was so badly handled that you missed the evidence of the real killer or you destroyed that evidence. That hurt the, the prosecution because it gave the defense the opportunity to say, you missed the real guy. And Christopher Hicks says there was another fundamental question. Could Dennis Oland really have committed such an horrific crime? You're talking about a patricide, a son brutally murdering his father. There would have to be something more to convince you that Dennis Olin committed this horrible murder against a man that he ostensibly loved. It just makes no sense. The two Olin murder trials have left St. John a city divided about whether the key to the case is guilt, innocence, or the defendant's last name. Technically, we don't have a two-tier legal system that some people feel that we do in the sense that not everybody would be able to keep fighting this long. The perception being that had Dennis Oland been a regular guy making forty or fifty thousand dollars as a financial advisor at TD. He'd be sitting in jail. Since his original conviction was overturned in 2016, Oland has officially been presumed an innocent man. I think he'll be free. But he's also spent almost eight years under a cloud. The suspect in his father's murder, then charged, convicted, imprisoned. Whatever the verdict in the retrial, Dennis Oland will soon learn which sentence he'll get, whether he's destined to be known as a son wrongly accused of killing his dad or a murderer rightly convicted.